uh, please do so. We're going to get going. Um, so I am not going to I'm not going to go on for too long, but I just want to thank you all for coming to uh, Women in Toronto Politics, the comment section, um, and uh, to take an opportunity to thank some of the people who have helped us to make this happen. Um, well, we couldn't have done it without the space, uh, so I'd like to thank the Centre for Social Innovation for not only offering the space pro bono, but also supporting us with uh, some of their amazing staff. So thank you, CSI. Um, I, uh, you can applaud if you want. <laughs> Uh, I'd also like to thank Steam Whistle for uh, donating the beer that we will be enjoying after the panel. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank uh, our caterers, Wendy and Christina at the back, uh, who you will be, I'm sure, encountering later. They've got some delicious goodies for you. Um, I would also like to thank Justin Drew, who designed our amazing logo. Um, and uh, Virginia Coos, who designed our poster, um, and UN Media, which is one of my fellow CSI tenants, and they were the ones who uh, provided the sound equipment and the lighting. And I'd also like to thank Torontoist for live streaming this session. Um, so if, if you're tweeting to anyone at home, you can let them know that they can catch the live stream at torontoist.com. Um, and uh, I do see a lot of smartphones out there, which is great. I encourage you to tweet your questions. Um, and you can use the Women in Toronto Politics hashtag, which is written on the blackboard, but it's W-I-T-O-Poly. Uh, so please do use that hashtag when you're tweeting. Um, and uh, I also really want to thank our panelists and moderator for taking time out of their very busy schedules to contribute to this discussion. I think it's a really important discussion to have, and I think now is a good time to have it. Um, and uh, none of this would have happened if uh, if Neville Park uh, or A.K. Alicia Pang had not written an amazing blog post. So the blog post was called "Too Many Dicks on the Dance Floor," right? Um, and it was about, you know, the Toronto politics Twitter community or the TO Poly community. Uh, lots of dudes. There's lots of, there's lots of women as well, but uh, many of the most prominent, uh, most followed, most retweeted, most influential people are men. Um, Robin will get into that a little bit more. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's an issue that has kind of been jogging a few of us for some time now, and I think it's a good time to discuss why that is and what we can do about it. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to the panel, and uh, thank you everyone. Thank we're all here. It's a conversation that's being dominated by the XY chromosome. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not a man hater. I love men, and I think it's fantastic and inspiring that so many guys are engaged and participating. They are not the issue. The issue is that women make up 52% of this city, and our take, our unique perspective, is not proportionally represented in that conversation. So maybe that's to be expected, given that we're not being represented politically either. Only 15 of the 44 councillors are female, and that new ratio was a record high. In the media, it's a bit better, but it's not perfect. The City Hall Press Gallery is pretty evenly split, but there are no female columnists, and I legit have a sheet taped to my desk that tra tracks the number of people who come into the office and think I'm the secretary. <laughs> Which I believe is because I'm the only woman in the office. Uh, the disparity, though, is most visible in the digital community. According to a fairly recent clout score breakdown, only nine of the most prominent voices on T.O. Poly are women. Of those, only two are not mainstream media journalists or counselors. One of them, Alicia Pang, aka Neville Park, is here with us today. Um, who incidentally, by the way, I went to high school with. Random. <laughs> anyway. Uh, in preparing for tonight, organizer uh, Stephanie uh, Guthrie and I sat down and made a list of the Twitter, uh, Twitter personalities we most enjoy reading and ones we felt added uh, the most to the debate. We excluded um, MSM employees and politicians. We came up with 27 prominent uh, TO Poly players. Nine are women. And to me, what's the most interesting thing is that the men on the list averaged about 2,500 followers. The women, only 1,300. So what is up with that? 
That's why we're here today, and we're going to talk about that. We've got about two hours and four Whip Smart panelists. I'm going to give each three minutes to introduce themselves, give an overview of their thoughts on the issue. Feel free to not take the full three minutes. Um, then we'll get to the discussion, which I think will take about an hour. I've got two main themes I want to touch on. Where are the women? It doesn't matter. And secondary, can anything be done to change this political sausage fest? <laughs> if you've got questions you want to uh, throw in during the discussion, please send them to me via Twitter, at Robin Doolittle, R-O-B-Y-N-D-O-O-L-I-T-T-L-E, um, or uh, at uh, W-I-T-O Polly. Um, and if you're tweeting this, use the hashtag. Thank you, Bob, told that. Um, after the hour, we'll open the floor to you guys. I'll take some questions uh, that arrive via Twitter as well as from the audience. If you want to talk from the audience, here's a warning. You have 60 seconds to ask your question. <laughs> if you do not ask your question in that 60 seconds, we will shut you down. <laughs> I am, there are going to be no extensions and no extension votes. <laughs> okay, panelists, you get two minutes to respond to that question. Same rules. Okay, so with that, I will throw the floor over to Nadia Swati, aka Matt Hattress. And I also have a Master's of Engineering from the University of Western Ontario, which I recently got. Um, I currently work in a mechanical analyst for an aerospace company, Mississauga. So that's my professional. And basically, things I've done around the city is the one thing I do is I help to organize the TTC Knit Along, which is an event happening every year this year in July 14th. And we basically get a bunch of group crafters together, and we knit and crochet on the TTC, and we take them on a little yarn crawl to a lot of the yarn stores via TTC. And there are prizes and goodie bags. Each participant pays ten dollars, and we take the proceeds in the end and give it to Sistering, which is a women's agency serving the home, homeless, marginalized, and low-income women in Toronto. Last year, we collected five hundred dollars for them, so that's great. So there are two reasons why I'm interested in this topic. The first being is, as a second-generation Canadian of Jamaican descent, I feel that policy, the policies of the current administration lead to a lower quality of life for low-income. Torontonians, particularly women of color and their children. Lack of daycare and affordable housing, cuts to transit and libraries, and increased user fees will um, put them further behind in the race that they are already losing. We need to remove barriers to success for them and not put up new ones. And the second reason is that as a woman of color in a male-dominated profession, I think it's extremely appropriate to disprove all stereotypes, and not just as it relates to sex, things like sexual orientation and color as well. I believe strongly that people should not be pigeonholed by these attributes and that everybody's opinion, expertise, experiences, and insights are an important part of the political discourse. And <laughs> okay, um, and one of them is City Hall. Um, and part of, part of the way I've covered City Hall, um, because I can't compete with the star, I can't compete with the globe on a daily churn up the news basis, I felt it was important uh, for my queer readers to have to see a, a personality there, to see somebody there tweeting, uh, to be a face, to be there asking questions, and, uh, and to, to have the queer side represented. Um, especially given that there are a lot of queer stories that go through City Hall. Um, obviously, Pride and Quiet are the first that come to mind, but there's so many issues that affect the queer community. Um, the obvious ones is transit. Every, everybody uses transit, even queer people. So there's queer angles to everything. <laughs> um, anything like that. So part of that is having a voice at City Hall and being there and, uh, and being that watchdog press, which is uh, what I see extra as. Where I come from, um, I've made the rounds at several different newspapers uh, in Toronto, the Toronto Star being one, um, 640 Toronto, I was, worked as a producer and a news reporter there. Um, I moved out to Peterborough uh, and spent four years writing for the Peterborough Examiner, um, and then I came back to Toronto, thankfully. <laughs> I have enough of Peterborough. <laughs> Uh, came back to Peterborough, or came back to Toronto after Peterborough, and got a job with Extra, and it's uh, it's been an amazing opportunity, um, not just to cover uh, quite an incredible beat such as City Hall, but I also cover uh, the ongoing fight around gay straight alliances um, and uh, any other queer issues that, that uh, come up. Um, yeah, um, 
moving on to that. I, I live in Parkdale and the 501 East Bound Streetcar runs through my neighborhood. Um, I'm pretty much your average chronically compared science fiction reading, angry, Macy Jewish lesbian cat lady. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I first started watching City Council be, um, uh, when I heard about the online meeting. I was worried about what the cuts would mean to my neighborhood, which has a lot of low-income people, a lot of people dealing with mental health and addiction issues, a, a lot of people of color, and generally people who, who mostly depend on those kind of public services. Um, and when I went, it was like such a fabulous train wreck that I had to keep watching. <laughs> um, but it, it's always been, it's always been nagging at me that the that there's been such there was such a disjoint between the people who showed up, the ordinary people who, who showed up to talk about their communities, and the people who get like op-ed columns and who get trend pieces on them in the Globe and Mail and things like that. And it's disturbingly reminiscent of the imbalance in, in the field I'm more familiar with, which is tech. Um, I'm, I'm a webmaster, I do WordPress and Drupal stuff. Um, I'm, al and I'm also on the board of my co-op, which I got into simply because of city council and thinking, oh, yay, budget committee, I can just be just like my Del Grande. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> came to him years ago, this is like 1949, and they came to me and said, we're going to start this, we're going to build this, we're going to have subways all across, and, uh, uh, all across Toronto, and it's going to be magnificent. And so he donated the land for a dollar, and he gave it to the city, and he said, you know what, I want to do my thing for this city. And that's what he did, and I, I thought, geez, Gramps, you're broke, and what's going to happen now? Um, but it was his way of giving back to the city. And so, fast forward, I've had kids I feel like I've got to give something to the city. And so I realized that, you know, we were being shut out. People, uh, community groups, weren't being listened to. Um, when it comes to politics, you go there and you're at City Hall and you get so frustrated because they all know what the right thing to do is, yet they forget to listen. So I thought, well, if I can run for mayor of Toronto, you know, I'll do what I can to, to try and get them to listen, to try and change the conversation. Um, I didn't have a, a hope in hell. I didn't think I was going to win. I thought maybe I could get the conversation to focus on transit, on some issues around social housing, and you know that'll be it. Maybe if I could get to 10th place, that would be great. And lo and behold, we got to about third place, and we cracked the champagne, and we celebrated, and I'd turn around to the press, and I'd say, no, nope, I'm going to win. And then I'd go back and celebrate the fact that we got to third place. But uh, I, I just... Uh, I fell in love with the city after that because I went from, from place to place to place. I think we did 90, I did 92 debates. And it was fantastic. It was a lot of work. But it allowed me to see all parts of the city that I hadn't known were there. And we have a fantastic city. So we have to do all we can to improve that, that, this city. And I want to thank women in Toronto politics for organizing this. Because more and more people need to get more informed. They need to know what's going on. And we need to um, help inform them. And we need to help get them involved. And let women especially know that we have to be there. We have to be part of the conversation. And we have to get more and more involved. So I, I want to thank you for, for hosting this. And there's no timer, so I can just go. Yeah, on. I'm going to shut you down. <laughs> <laughs> so I was watching. Don't worry. Yeah. But you made it in. Does it matter? that there's not more women speaking at the end of the day. There are pretty thoughtful guys who are commenting here. I think it does matter uh, because having um, not just women at the table uh, speaking about issues and talking about issues, women journalists asking questions, um, gender diversity brings more than just uh, a different perspective to it. It brings a lifetime of experience. And we're talking about, uh, as was raised in, in Neville's wonderful post was that um, so many of the, of the cuts and, and, and efficiencies that we're trying to talk about here, that the, the Ford agenda is talking about, these are, these are cuts that disproportionately affect women. 
and disproportionately affect uh, women who are marginalized, such as queer women and women of color. Um, we're talking about daycare, we're talking about uh, libraries, women who may be taking university on the side. having these discussions, carrying on these discussions is super important, um, and it brings uh, a diversity to the conversation, it brings a realness to the conversation. Um, so I think it's important, as, as Sarah brought up, that we make it more accessible for women to get involved in the first place. If, it's, if City Hall isn't accessible, um, if it's daunting, if it looks like you walk into a room and it's a white male dominated room and makes people feel uncomfortable, makes people feel unwelcome, um, then why would they want to get involved in the first place? Um, there's a lot of wa ways that women could be involved more, and there's a lot of ways that uh, we could encourage it. First thing that comes to mind is changing the voting system to get women to run. And Alicia, does it matter? Where are all the, where are all the women? What's the... Are you trolling me? <laughs> <laughs> um, really, this reminds me of what happened in the American political blogging scene in 2005, where people like um, Mark, like uh, Marcus Gianfos, were like, "Where are all the women bloggers?" Who, of course, they're all along. Um, it's not really a case of people. Well, it's it's not really a case of people not choosing to join in. It's a case of people being actively overlooked or of beginners being discouraged from getting involved at all. It matters because when you're seen as homogenous like that, like you walk in, and, yeah, like you said it's always, it is a bad scene. It's not fun for anyone. Um, nobody's opinions get challenged. People don't learn new things, and politics should be about working with people who are different from you. So you're saying that people who are starting are either being just ignored or the barriers to entry are very high. And we're not doing enough to lessen that. What, what are some of the barriers? Okay, first off, it takes a lot of time. I mean, like, I'm a freelancer, so I can spend hours, like, watching the live stream or, like, doing work for, from city council. Most people can't. Um, not people with, like, real jobs and lives and stuff. And there's not enough like simple explaining stuff going around because like we can just say like oh we're our netting everyone knows exactly what we're talking about but there's a lot of people out there who would be interested they they need like backgrounders like this is who this person is this is what this issue is about this is why it's important this is how council works because it takes a lot of like um it takes, it takes a lot of knowledge that a lot of people who have never been involved in politics before don't have access to. So, Sarah, I covered the mayoral election and watched dozens and dozens of your debates. What do you think that you brought to that discussion that your male running mates were not bringing? What was, did, did you actually... Intellect? <laughs> is women collect different uh, information differently and they approach uh, situations differently um, so I think that in the uh, mayoral race uh, I wanted to get out the ideas on um, transit social housing those ideas I want to focus on those ideas and so we got it out quite quickly and for me I want to balance so if we're going to bring out transit well we have to bring out how we're going to pay for it so I came out with, with something that a lot of people said, you're crazy, you're not going to win on that. But um, it was toll roads. And, but I felt it needed to be brought out and it needed to be talked about. Um, whereas I think the men that I was competing against looked more at 
how can we get votes, what, what can we tell voters. It was more of a, not a, a look that we need to really talk about this, but it was more of a, how do we get votes right away. Um, but I think that's what women bring to negotiations at City Hall. Um, there really, as you know, there aren't many negotiations that, that survive, that do well. There's a, this divisiveness that's going on right there, right now. And I see the women, I see the women counselors we have coming together saying, how do we get over this? How do we talk to each other? How do we come together and really move the city forward? And I think that's what women bring to politics, and that's why they're so necessary, so necessary we get involved. I wrote a piece for the Toronto Star saying, women, please vote with your purse. And that's the one thing I found is raising money. Um, to, I, I went to women that we profiled in my magazine that I felt, geez, I helped them, they should help me. And they didn't. And a lot of women don't realize how much money it takes. Politics is very expensive. And so you deal, I was up against men that had, well, Rocco Rossi raised over a million too. I was only able to raise 200,000. Um, so that was the problem that I faced, and I hear that again and again from women, women going into politics. So I, I really believe we need to get focus on that and say, you know, there's got to be some way to help women who are going into politics to get in there and to run a, a viable campaign so that they get more of a, an opportunity. I'm going to go around your... Well, I am comfortable yelling. It's probably not ladylike. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to put somebody in in a minute, but I guess that's a mother who knows about doing care better. She's saying that, you know, a policy issue that everyone was talking about transit, because she's a pragmatic woman, she wanted to think of a way to do this, as opposed to just kind of throwing out an idea with no plan, which some other people have maybe done. So, just kind of thinking what your thoughts are on that, you know, the, a female perspective on policy. And, and Nadia, I guess if you want to kind of jump in here, like, what do you think that a, a female can add to this debate, and, and um, particularly kind of in the context of what, of what Sarah is saying as somebody's watching this unfold? I think there's a lot missing when you only get sort of one side of the story and we all have different experiences based on our background, but based on our sex, based on where we grew up. So I think um, some, a lot of, sort of this is my experience, I guess, working in where I work, is that females tend to, I think, they tend to listen more to both sides too and get the whole story and figure out a solution and not sort of jump in and want to be heard all the time. Maybe that's just me, though. I think that's a personality thing, too, but I think that's a very good trait you could sort of bring to the table in politics, because then you're not just sort of, this is what I want, and I just want this, and that's all. I find that a lot, too, in my workplace in engineering, where you, you sort of have this idea, and this is the idea you want to push, but there might be something better, and sometimes it's hard to get sort of people to um, see what you're trying to say, and I feel like I feel sometimes the women, when they're around the table, sort of get all the information and put it together better than the men. But maybe that's just me. <laughs> um, I also feel like... Um, I also feel... Well, I think, too, that part of the background, the way women are sort of brought up is, as little girls, we're, fought, we're taught to sort of be nice. And agreeable. That can sort of be too a barrier to entering into politics, which politics isn't always nice, so to speak. But I think when you're taught to be nice to everybody and to be agreeable and to sort of be good little girls and likable, then sometimes it's easier to sort of work with other people than when you're just taught to be like your boy. You're sort of you don't have to be nice, sort of thing. So I think that's another positive trait that women can bring to the table. Okay. Well, that's a whole other load. Feel free to just jump on in here, by the way. Women, taught to be nice. Hold on, hold on, we're taking a look. It reminds me of Dave Meslin's post that, that he wrote on International Women's Day about women on city council and how they've tended to take roles. And he noted that a lot of them have been the key negotiators on various issues. 
And yeah, it's hard not to see that as a gender thing because like, in my experience, like I went to a Drupal conference, for example, where there was an impromptu session aimed at beginners. And that's where all the women showed up. So it's kind of like you're taught to constantly underestimate yourself. And I'm not saying that's a good thing, just that politics could definitely use a little humbleness. A lot of it is ego-driven. Can I just have someone? Yeah, please. Don't wait for me. Uh, oh, I won't. <laughs> uh, it's also the manner dividing the discussion along gender lines. Like, I remember, think back to the, um, uh, right after the, the marathon council meeting where uh, Jennifer Arango, I might be pronouncing her name wrong, um, where she gave that diatribe lecture to, to the men on council. It was fabulous to watch. And then there was a screaming match back and forth between uh, between uh, Manalini and Holiday and a few others, I think. Um, and I, I remember Doug Holiday was quoted afterwards saying that um, that the reason why there aren't uh, many women, uh, there aren't enough women on, according to her, enough women on executive, um, is because it would have been difficult for Fora to find women who would push his right-wing agenda. As if being a woman, you're automatically and intrinsically left-wing. Um, you know, that, that's not necessarily true. And if it is, we have to ask ourselves why that is. And you know, if we look at some of the women who, who are on council who have been leading the charge on, uh, for, for lefty causes, um, a lot of their arguments have, I would assume, to be sensible causes, to be sensible positions, you know, rather than pushing this extreme agenda. That, um, and if it is masculine, if that's if it's dividing you along gender lines, why is that? That that, that social issues are automatically uh, feminine or, or a women's issue. Sarah? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm going to come out here and say, as a as a woman running against um, five other men. I had actually the advantage, and that was, um, they couldn't attack me. And it was very interesting, when you're on stage, and you realize that their handlers are saying, don't attack Sarah, don't attack Sarah, you can really just let loose, and you can't do anything. Um, the one thing you're trained about doing is, don't go high, go low, right? <laughs> so that screechy voice that um, often a lot of women politicians get, they're, they're training it, it out of us, and they're saying, go low. But now we have Rob Ford at council doing it for us, so it's not going to change the balance. Um, is he here? I hope he's not here. Somebody take him. I'm going to take a guess and say he's not here. <laughs> I doubt it. I really do. Can I, sorry, can I write ahead? Can I jump in on that point about the voice thing? This is just a side story. First day of journalism school and broadcast class. Sue Ann Kelman, I don't know if you know her or not. Prof there. I'll be able to sit in a, a room and I'll do like a, an opening kind of segment like, I'm Robin Doolittle and I'm blah 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 blah. Because all the women, they're all voices, we all kind of talk like this, I don't know. And uh, we all have, it's your orgasm voice. <laughs> I'm not kidding, this is your first day of university. And uh, we all have to do your orgasm voice, because that's your real voice. Because women train themselves to talk up here, because I don't know why, so... I don't know what to change that was. Anyway, to that, again, I'm really fascinated by this idea of, you know, like, too nice. Is it, are we too nice to be here? So, Sarah, what were you too, and I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think so. I, I, at the end of the day, we, yes, you're trained to be nice, but you're also trained to be assertive and, and strong, and I think you just have to bring those to bear. Um, people weren't saying I was nice. Well, my, 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 the other candidates were not calling me nice. Because um, I was attacking, and you do have to attack. You do have to be, um, what's the word I want, polite. And I don't believe in, in playing dirty, So, um, but that's the way I am. Um, there were other women that have played dirty. I don't agree with that, but I also don't think, I think that we're strong, and yes, we are programmed to be nice, but I think that can be used as an asset in negotiations once we're in the job. And I think when you are competing and you're, you're running for election, um, Nice does help as well. Uh, if you look at um, George Smitherman was very nice to me the entire time through the whole campaign. And who did I, when I finally had to back out because I ran out of money, who did I back? He shared a lot of similar views and, and positions that I shared, so it made it easy. But the fact that he was nice to me throughout also helped. He wasn't insulting. He wasn't criti very critical in a rude way. He was critical, but he never insulted. And so I think there is room to use that training we have 
to lower our voices and be strong. And, and I think if we can do that and focus on what we need to do and the strategy um, when you are running, I want, I want to shout this out to every woman here. We need you. Please run and please get the money first. Get it there, have it there, get your strategy in place. There's women like me that will help you. Please run. Jump in, don't wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> About the niceness thing. The downside to that is that the threshold for niceness is set a lot higher for women. Because like, I, I saw um, Jennifer's deputation and merely pointing out that executive committee was packed with old white guys they, they like could not handle it. They like totally lost their shit. They lost all their shit. And like... No more shit. No, 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 no more shit. <laughs> they, had, they had to go order more. And like... Even, even just like pointing out like, oh, this seems dominated by, by white guys. Even talking about gender in certain male dominated fields will get you jumped on. And asserting yourself will get you called a bitch. And with the and, and with the low voice is they're going to like police your gender. So there's room for niceness, but it's not it, it's not that easy. It's not easy to be nice. Um, basically, what it comes down to is that we sort of need to educate, I guess, each other and other women out there that you there is a way to be assertive without being turned, like Neville said, a bitch or what, whatever else, they, whatever other labels they can throw at you and. Emotional is <laughs> But we have to, I think a lot of it is too is education on that. We have to educate the women out there that yes, you can run for politics and you can be nice and you can play in this game. You don't have to go down and dirty and be a bitch to do this, basically. And that it, you are valued and that um, we do need them out here there. So I think the biggest thing for all of us too is like just getting the word out and educating people. Afraid to be a bitch, you know. If we shouldn't think of that as a pejorative, and we, you know, if, if we need to be a bitch, we should be a bitch, and not to be worried about whether we're going to upset or offend anybody. I used to have a bumper sticker that said, "I'm emotional, deal with it," and that's it. I mean, that's true. Those emotions bring so much to the table that we can't forget about that. Well, it's like it depends how you define emotion, like. Like getting your getting yourself worked up because you're afraid you won't be able to send your kids to, day, to daycare. That's emotional, but like being really huffy and giving like a twelve angry men style speech because you you've trumped up this imaginary suburb which is downtown war in your head. That's just being logical or something. Not naming names. <laughs> Can I throw something out here that that Sarah touched on that I, I find that I deal with also in, in journalism? Um, uh, an editor of mine once said to me, the, you know, your biggest enemy is the, the women reporters that you work with. And that was just, it, but the idea was that the, they will, there's only room for one really successful woman. And you know what? It's kind of true. Women are awful to one another. That's just how it is. So I think, you know, part of this discussion needs to be, are, are we really, is it kind of like you want to be the prominent female voice out there? Or, yeah, actually, I know it's something. There's like a poem, and uh, some people might shudder, but it was, uh, it was who was it? It was um, Kip Kipling, and he wrote a poem called "The Female of the Species Is More Deadly Than the Male." And I think there is a little bit of truth to that. When I'm in business, I found that um, the men were much more uh, willing to help in the print and media industry than women were. And so we make we've made an award around trying to get women to um, promote and help each other. So a woman that goes above and beyond in helping other women, we're going to be awarding that woman. And I think it's really important that we recognize that trait. It may be genetic, maybe you know we're protecting every child we have. There may be some elements of that. But I don't think we have room for that in politics or business. So. There can only be a, be one woman like I don't know Highlander or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to me because when you're in a male-dominated field, there's all or male-dominated scene. There is a temptation to be to like be the girl, to be like one of the guys. 
And it's hard not to think if that's what's going on when, like, I look at the papers and, like, they've each got their, like, one really opinionated, not very good woman colonist. Like, you're speaking about. <laughs> Sue and Levy, Rosie DeMello, Christy Blackford, and Margaret Wynn. Hey, I don't know. We're talking about Sue Ann Levy? <laughs> no? No? Okay. No. Um, like, what, like, do they look at, like, their, their like, masthead and think, like, oh, yeah, we've got our woman. Is that enough? I, I don't know if that's what's going on. I'm not the one who's in publishing. Like, it's still in a checkbox, essentially. And, and you know what? For for you see that sort of changing in newspapers. We you know we see the advent of alternative media, bringing new voices, bringing female voices. Uh, publications like the Torontoist, uh, Torontoist, not the Torontoist, sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, Torontoist, and uh, an extra, and and the Grid, and these publications do bring more women. I think Women's Post it's in the title. Um, but we do have to expect better from the dailies. We have to expect them to bring more women voices, not just to uh, to the columns page, but the editorial board, who are making the decisions, what's going on the front page, who are making the decisions about what will be covered on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the, largely the people who write the daily assignments for the reporters at the daily newspapers are men. Um, I've worked at the Toronto Star, I, they're wonderful people, but uh, it's, it's men. It's, it's a huge sausage fest, and um, and, it, and I'm sure it's the same at, at all the dailies. So I think we need to change that as well. To that point, does it help to throw like a token woman, like no. token woman columnist, right about your placenta? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, I actually wanted to focus in you know, on um, getting elected and having um, the, the, the system that we've got in place. Um, Red's ballots are, or rabbit are back there, and I, I hope all of you will go back and read the literature because it's so important that we do something today about the system that we have in place. I felt when I was running for mayor, I was being pressured, and I, I don't know if you were at the editorial board meeting where I came in there, and I was being pressured by um, the Toronto Star, especially in that editorial meeting, board meeting. They were saying, you're the Ralph Nader. You're the one that's going to break it up. You, you should step down. You should step down. And they just kept yelling this at me until I, I think I finally told the guy to shut up. I found out he was the editor at the time, which was not a good thing to say. And my handler was just crying when I said that. But um, other than that, uh, we really have to change the system so that we um, can allow more opportunities for women. Right now, you have to have a lot of money behind you. If we went to something like write ballots, um, you wouldn't need as much, and there would be much more opportunities for women. What do you think? And then we're going to go to Nadia, because you're just hiding down there. And it's not as pushy as Okay, Get out yeah. there, grab your mug, be a bitch. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 I was just going to say, the, the reason why lone, I, I, well, can't, the candidates have got our force drop is because of the fear of, like, vote splitting! And that's, a, a, like, obviously different work the same way in, like, a business or whatever. But, yeah, that would that would definitely be a first step to getting more women into politics. So yeah, I think Neville's totally right about the vote splitting thing, but I'm like, but my thought now is who sows that fair? Should we be going to the mainstream media and saying, stop talking about vote splitting? <laughs> because that was like, that's a huge thing, like in the media, as soon as you have three people or more running, it's like somebody's gonna split the vote and then it's gonna be awful and this guy's gonna come from the middle and blah, 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 blah. So, and I think, yeah, you're right, because also, I think two people inherently have a fear of losing, right? You want to go out there and you want to win and you don't want to lose all this money and seem to be, you failed, even though you really haven't, if you've gone out there and tried like the rest of us and just sort of sit at home. So, I think too that, um, I think that would be a really good thing to say, you know, I did go out there and I did try and I did get somewhere and it's not a failure because I didn't win. So, just before I kind of switch gears and go to the next phase, I don't know if Nadia put this to you, what do you think is missing from not having more women commenting in the T.O. Polly discussion, if anything? Anything's missing. You know what, I don't think that there isn't enough women commenting, because I 
maybe it's just me, but I follow a lot of women, T.O. polyphonters, and I do follow some men, too. Maybe it's just that um, not enough women are being followed. Maybe it's a case of we just need um, people to realize, you know, there's other people out there other than the gold piece of the world and, you know, graphic bags. <laughs> no offense, guys, I love gold <laughs> I, for whatever reason, maybe they're just with your news because they write in daily papers and they're reporters and we're just, you know, people that sort of take an interest and tweet about it. But, um, we just, I think maybe we need to, people need to sort of expand their horizons and just look to the other people in Teopolis. It's not just four or five people tweeting. There's hundreds of us out there. And there's a lot of women and there's a lot of people that are, like, in council every day watching this. Like, I know, I don't want to call it a matter of thing, but he's not in he, all the council meetings. Nap's always pretty much there because of her job. Um, I'm not in a, a lot of the council meetings that go to some of them, but I mean, like, you can get a lot of good coverage if you know where to look, and maybe we just need to sort of advertise, you know, maybe you should go look at this person if you're interested in this topic. Okay, you have one more comment. Okay. That's it. Okay, keep going. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm just going to say that, that you have to consciously train yourself to look for people who are outside the norm, otherwise you're just going to end up recommending another long list of white guys. And in order to do, the, to do that, you have to acknowledge that having a scarcity of women, a scarcity of people of color is a problem, and that's something that a lot of people are not ready to do, and they're not ready to put time and effort into solving. You don't necessarily... Yeah, through that up there. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a gender attached to your name. So, is anyone interested in jumping in here to answer the tough, unpopular question, what are women not doing that they should be doing? And you guys out there, I'm very, I enjoy your, your comments to me, but I love some comments that I can read out here. I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying the Doug Ford jokes as they roll in, but I can't read them. So what do you think that we're doing wrong? I just, I, I find with Twitter, when you um, expose more of yourself, when you show more of what you're feeling, uh, that tends to get more followers. So, and I find women don't expose themselves as much as men. Sorry for the play on that. Expose but themselves. You have to, um, I, I find you have to really say how you feel um, and not be afraid to say things. And I think sometimes we hold back a little bit too much. Okay, but that's because being openly female on the internet is, is a substantial risk. And not all of us who don't do this shit for our And you're open about it, you'll get you'll get death threats, you'll get rape threats, you'll get insults, you'll get people calling you fat, hairy bitch, dyke, ugly slut, and we'll be taken less seriously in general. So it takes a like for it was a conscious decision for me just to like allow people to know that I was female, to acknowledge that I was female because that's yeah. Um, I thought I remember when I first ran, um, I read this horrible tweet. It said, you know, Sarah Thompson's a fat, ugly bitch, and I was like, oh my god, what do I do about this? And my uh, campaign manager, who was a woman, said, relax, it's just me. And I said, what? She said, I'm building your brand. And I was like, oh! But from that point on, I completely love all the, the horrible tweets, because they build your brand. So, you know, next time you get that horrible death threat tweet, tweet I would say, Maybe you know what? It could be somebody, it, it's helping you. So don't be afraid of them. Um, and But you're right, there is the fear of somebody's going to know where I live. I went through that. I had um, I had a columnist write about me in the star showing where I lived. He had promised he wouldn't show where I lived. Um, and from that point on, every time I saw a man standing outside, I went to find my kids because I was scared for my kids. Not for me, but for my kids. Did you want to build a fence around your house? I wanted to get my frying pan and go out there and friggin' yeah. But the, the, the fact is that we, I think we still have to be um, strong. If we want to build our characters there, we have to have that emotion. Andrea or Nadia, what are you doing? I have a couple of comments about that too, because I think, again, I think that's sort of learned in great childhood behavior, because as a woman you should be afraid. Because I know now, I'm like, I'm in my 30s, my early 30s, and if I tell my parents I'm going out at night, it's a huge thing, I'm taking the TTC, it's dangerous. Like, I'm a grown up, I can do this. Like, I've been through this before, and I think maybe that's part of it too that women, because you have in the back of your mind that something could happen to you if somebody knows where you live approximately, or they could stalk you or something, maybe you don't want to be as open on the internet, and that might lead you to holding back. 
which means you have lots of connection with people. I think also, to a previous point that we brought up, is that you're seen as an emotional person if you sort of say certain things. Like, you know, I'm feeling crappy today, or that really sucked, and you're just a stupid emotional woman, you're dismissed. Okay, well, for, frankly, um, are we doing anything wrong? If we're, if we're concentrating too much um, on um, how people are going to be perceiving us by our gender, then we're doing it wrong. Frankly, we should be going into Twitter, we should be going into council, we should be going into Queen's Park, guns blazing, who the hell cares what we are? You know, and if anybody wants to take issue with me because I'm a woman, I'll go toe to toe with them right back. Um, there's this really prominent prolific troll in the Teal Poly hashtag who's been tweeting about which I thought I'd read some of these as giving an example. Oh my god, I guess it's Safa. <laughs> Safa, we're talking about you. Is Safa, Safa here? here? Is Safa he... said he was here. Oh my god. He said he was here to check out chicks. Oh my god. So I. <laughs> okay, no, he says. Okay, everyone turn to your neighbor if you see a lion on that phone. <laughs> And he says to the women in Joe Pauly account, let's see, you've got angry left-wing cook, feminist, effeminate males in dyke supporting session, that's nonchalant of women. Um, the bras at the table with the exception of Thompson, oh, you, are idiots, seriously, it's embarrassing. Um, There's um there's a bit of passion, there's a bit of he's getting to us and that's what but study what he's saying, right? And say and I think we need to say the same things. We need to not be afraid of saying what we feel. Yeah, exactly. I actually think the assumption that Seth is a man. I am making an assumption that it's a man. Yeah, yeah. 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 Part of the reason why women may not put themselves out there, because I mean, who wants to be called a stupid bitch all the time on the internet? I mean, I know you can block people. Build your brand. Build your brand, but things are today, so I'll totally unblock all the trolls I block. Sure. <laughs> but sure, but you know, we, we should also not be afraid to have public debates with these people, expose them for who they are. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the time too, though, it's an exercise of frustration. I know some people sort of revel in doing it for a little bit, but I mean, you keep saying the same things over and over again, and they keep saying the same thing back to you over and over again, and you sort of get tired. Okay, can I jump in here for a second with the, the microphone and stuff? Yeah. Okay, here's my issue with... So who's making it about the gender issues, though? Is it is it the trolls themselves, or yeah, is I it... I would say it's the trolls that start, and then you just want to be like, are you kidding me? You're an idiot, I'm not telling you what an idiot you are. And then you're like start fighting with them about these silly things. That was true. And, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's a waste of our time. We shouldn't be delving into this. You know, if we want to have debates with people online, I fully encourage that. It's not only fun, but it exposes them for the for the for the bigots that they are. Um, but you know, I think we should be giving this. But as soon as you know, if, if, if it just it goes, if the conversation starts to go in circles, um, you know, ending in each tweet ending in the word bitch, then it's you know you're going nowhere. You're not changing any hearts and minds. You've done the duty. Um, by exposing them, and, and, and that's pretty much it we can do. We don't want to waste our time with, uh, with these trolls. The, uh, the people who are more difficult to deal with, like it's not the Sapa and hey Miroslav, the Miroslavs of the world, it's, <laughs> it's the people who are probably on our sides, like um, crap, I, I remember um, earlier today another a, another um, tweeter in Women in Poly was complaining about something she found sexist. And a guy who I met, who I actually met at council meetings, was saying, Why are you wasting your time? This That's not really sexist. Like, you know, like, as a man, I'm going to tell you what sexism is. It's the resistance from people who think that they are genuinely, uh, genuinely good guys who are doing their best to help. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Nadia? Angry women off-putting? Angry <laughs> I think angry anybody is off-putting. I mean, nobody wants to follow somebody whose tweets are all in caps and there's angry yelling all the time. <laughs> it's 
it's not, it doesn't make for a fun day, but I don't think it's just, I don't think it's, I don't think the Tio Poly tweeters are angry women. I think they're just reasonable, sensible people just saying what's on their mind. So, and I'm a little bit frustrated. I think, though, a lot of Tio Poly is pretty much frustrated about what's going on today, so there's a lot of frustrated people. <laughs> Can I just kind of ask, just going down the line, because I forgot to, this was my initial first question. You guys all have like a reason, like a pretty good following um, on Twitter or in the city in general. And how did you get there and kind of how did you cultivate a following? And do you have any advice for people out there who might be? I, I probably have the least number of followers, I think, among us. I think I have 500 something. Um, but I. I don't think I actually set out to really cultivate a following. The, reason, the whole reason I got Twitter is because, I think two years ago for TTC No Long, the person that, Michelle Hodgins, the overall organizer of this, and she says, everybody get Twitter, so we tweet about this. I'm like, what? <laughs> so like the morning of the No Long, I signed up for my Twitter account. And basically, what happened is as the election kept happening and Rob Ford started gaining momentum, I'm like, oh my god, what the hell is happening to my city? And you start connecting with people like that. And it's just, it was really sort of organic. So I started tweeting about, politics stuff and tweeting debates and then somebody would tweet back at me and then I'd follow them because I was interested in what they're saying and that's pretty much how I gained followers, just sort of by putting out what was in my head on Twitter. Yeah, well likewise, I didn't I certainly didn't go into cultivating followers. Working you have an advantage when you work for a publication, be it alternative or mainstream. Um, that automatically you cultivate followers uh, because they follow you for uh, for posts of your of your journalism. But I, I've really enjoyed uh, live tweeting events and live tweeting meetings and and, and city hall uh, and Queens Park uh, particularly um, because it's it's a way. And I, I think it was it was Jonathan who said this. That, you know, don't scream in council, scream into Twitter, and it totally is healthy. It's therapeutic to do that. Uh, <laughs> Um, which I've been known to do. So, <laughs> um, no, I think it's really healthy and I think it's therapeutic and I think, much like Sarah said, um, showing your um, showing your true self, showing that emotion. These are emotional issues we're talking about. We're talking about uh, uh, our, our lives, so what, how we go about our lives. That's what municipal politics represents. It represents our daily lives. And so we do get emotional, and it's okay to be emotional. And, and I think it's uh, really great that Twitter is uh, is a vehicle for that. And, and it's been wonderful to get people talking about it. So in terms of get cultivating followers, not so much. But if, if I can add to the discussion at all, then that's why I went. Into, that's why I went on Twitter. Um. I, I was on Twitter for years and years before I started tweeting about politics. What really started getting me followers was, one, unlocking my account by not being so paranoid, um, and two, um, Goldsby mentioning me and saying that um, this person's tweets on city council are really good. You should follow them. And this is a, and that. Hold up! Hold up! I'm not. I'm not done. I'm not done. Yeah. First. Um, <laughs> if you want to get more women's voices into Toronto politics, you need to do that again. Guys, who, who, like people with a lot of followers, need to like look at someone who's doing great stuff but isn't getting a lot of attention and say, "Hey, this person's really smart. This person's really observant. This person is doing important work." It may take the spotlight away from you for a second, but that's the kind of thing you have to do. I purposely went out and tried to get followers. Um, I ran for mayor of Toronto. That helped a lot. Um, I had a team of people that would tweet for me, and I was not allowed to tweet. Only I did. And they would get so mad. So um, I would tweet personal things, my comments on, or I would tweet back when somebody would think exceptionally mean. Um, those, those sorts of things. And so I kept getting slapped. And, and I remember my, one of my campaign managers actually saying, I am throwing out that that blackberry if you tweet again. Promise me you won't tweet anything so volatile. When I ran for the province, I remember a tweet, it was terrific. It was during Fukushima and somebody had tweeted, well, I guess the idea that nuclear is clean and green has been thrown out the fucking window. And it was a beautiful tweet and I retweeted it. I had calls from Queens Park every five minutes. Can you please take it down? Please don't tweet that. It was, it was quite an eye opener. But and for me, I, I, for me, it was it ran true to my spirit, and I couldn't take it down. 
Um, I find, they finally negotiated, I think I would get uh, more help if I did. And I think I got that out of them, it was terrific. So I, I did take it down, although I've repeated it again and again and again. So I think really being true to your spirit and who you are and showing that on Twitter will help. I also agree that people with large followings, well, if we find somebody, um, a woman that is, is tweeting and, and talking to you, Polly, we've got to retweet. That's how we can grow um, our followers and that's how we can grow our voice back. Okay, someone just tweeted at me and said, are we too obsessed with Twitter? I don't need to ask that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, I think everyone in this room is tweeting, which is great. Okay. So, with the, uh, so some of the things that you guys commented on uh, that I thought were interesting. If you're trying, if you're if you're a woman out there, or just a, if you're anybody out there trying to get followers, I think you know the idea of um, really covering an event. It's not just like a random quip when your paper comes in the morning or something. It's or kind of just your, your thoughts, it's, you know, it's watching something unfold and giving information, like putting information out there. Um, and, uh, and uh, Alicia, what did you say when you, you were wanting to be less paranoid? It's a privacy thing. Oh yeah, you're, if you're scared of privacy, this isn't going to work for you, so. Yeah. I, I actually, um, one of the things we kept being told is Twitter doesn't matter in politics. In Twitter, Facebook, those social media, it doesn't make a difference. And I think, um, I mean, we're being told this by people that have been in politics for a long time. Um, I think it, it is starting to matter. I think we can, women tend to be more grassroots oriented. So the issues that get spoken about on Twitter, on Facebook, are important issues. We have to keep them circulating. But I think it can matter. I think social media will matter in the next elections coming up. And I think it's growing. And um, I think being savvy on social media is key for women in politics. Anyone really still saying that social media and Twitter doesn't matter? Are people actually still who's living under a rock? <laughs> no, I, it totally no, matters. Studies say that it doesn't. It makes only twenty percent. It's not a big Wow. Well, I mean, it, it, it certainly. Again, this could be the bubble that I live in. You know, this could be the, the journalism, the lefty, the pinky bubble. Um, but um, I, yeah, I think it totally matters because I think it, it, it does drive the discussion and it opens hearts and minds to issues. It brings so many people to politics who might not, not have been a part of politics. I'll give it to you two ladies in a second. <laughs> uh, um, it brings a lot of people to discussion. I, I know from my personal circle of friends um, that, it, that I, am, I am by far the, 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 the person who tweets the most, but it's brought friends to politics who might never have been involved or even interested in municipal politics. Um, regardless of who's, who's sitting in the mayor's chair. So yeah, I think, well, obviously by your story about Queen's Park calling you all the time about your one tweet, it obviously means that Twitter doesn't matter, hello. Yeah, so, totally. but I think too that um, we sort of too have to make a connection too to the outside world, so actually talking to people who aren't on Twitter, because a lot of people I know aren't on Twitter. I do sometimes, I used to leave my Twitter and Facebook accounts, I don't anymore, but I do tweet some of my links to Facebook, because I know people who are, in my circle of friends who are totally interested in TL Poly but don't want to get Twitter for whatever reason. And they've thanked me and said, you know, it's great, I get to keep up on what's going on, thanks for informing me. So I think, too, that you have to sort of get outside your bubble a little bit and talk to, you know, sort of family, friends. Um, one of the cool things that Shelley Carroll had done during the last budget is she said, you know, invite me over and I'll come to your kitchen table and talk to five people about the budget. And I think, you know, we as probably tutors need to do more of that sort of thing. <laughs> Shelly just walked in! I know! Shelly! Still occupy your kitchen! <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, Nutty's absolutely right about having to take it offline as well, but I was just going to say one of the advantages of the Twitter is that it makes politics fun, and God knows Canadian politics could stand to be more fun. Like, I wouldn't, like, I like watching Star Trek reruns. I would like never watch like Bull Talk, except like <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, and, and so you started like live tweeting it, like I, yeah, like, like the hashtag is kind of boring. Bull Talk, party. <laughs> yeah, but it's fun. Like the, when you're like watching a bunch of other people and you're making fun of it and stuff like that, and so that that like provides an impetus to like I don't know, talk to other people about it. Okay. I think it helped because in, in the, this last municipal election, we had a sex scandal, we had a drug scandal. So those things kind of started it, 
And I think that can help when we've got the real meat there, we've got something to talk about. And I think, actually, Mayor Ford, we have to thank him for giving us something every week. Every day, every day. Everything we do to up your followers is to do reporting. I know something you know, like that Goldsby does so well, and that Matt Elliott also does really well. Is they like break stuff and they do journalism as opposed to just commenting, and that's invaluable. And um, a lot of the mainstream media journalists, myself included, don't always do that uh, for some of the issues that they're covering. So that's a great way to get out there as well. Um, the other ones taken away: have a personality, own your bitch. And, uh, and and live tweet events. So I think that that's pretty good for the first part of this. Do we have any comments via Twitter and that people want to, or, or questions? And if we have questions in the the audience, or, yeah, do you want to throw it on over there? I'm going to give you one minute. Okay. I'm going to go over here. Question. My name is Timmy Syed. Hi, Timmy. Everybody follows me. Actually, okay. <laughs> so, does it help to have a blog if you're not a journalist to break the stories, to be the female graphic man, to be the Goldsby est, <laughs> rather than just tweeting? Because that's my criticism: is that when I look for female bloggers to just read. I don't find as many as I would like to be reading. So we could be doing a little more work, it sounds like. And that's, I think, a, a fair comment. Is that, is anyone else, is anyone interested in making that unpopular comment? <laughs> that's just probably true? I'll, I'll counter that. I mean, I don't, I don't think you need to have a blog. And I, in fact, I think Twitter kind of is a blog. Twitter's a live blog. I mean, that's how I look at Twitter. I sort of, uh, if, if I need to write long form, I have a newspaper to, to publish um, my rants about whatever. Um, so I look at Twitter as that, but if I wasn't employed in a newspaper, I probably would have a blog. I probably would want uh, a space for that. And, uh, you know, Neville's blog, uh, she uses it. Hmm? Not a lot. Not a lot, but you know, you have the potential of using that as your own personal publication. There's no... If you didn't write that blog of, post, this would not have it, happened. No, exactly. But the boundaries of what is a mainstream media journalist and, a, and an alternative media journalist and a tweeter and a, and a blogger, all those lines are blurred. Um, everybody's a journalist. If you have a smartphone and you have a Twitter account and you're at a city council meeting tweeting about it, you're a journalist. That's what you are. Um, you know, we... we Journalists hold, our person, hold ourselves to personal standards of ethics, um, which, uh, you know... It, it can be <laughs> 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 Not every journalist. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, yeah, but, uh, but you, <laughs> most do. Most do. I would hope anyway. <laughs> Did you want to add to this, <laughs> Okay, so um, maybe I should put your own How many people out here actually would read a blog on a regular basis? Politics, anything? Okay, how about just politics? You might be speaking. Yeah. I know, maybe I'm speaking already, but I know personally, like, I tweet a whole lot, but I don't really follow blogs because I'm not, I don't know, I just don't feel like I have the time to do it, so I don't yeah. read blogs, and I'm not a big person not writing huge things, so that's why I don't write a blog. <laughs> yeah, and like, for me, like, it takes me such a long time to write a blog post that that by the time I'm like finished it or whatever, then like the issue is usually over. Unless it's something dragged up again. And, and we found it when it's posts that the shorter you make it the better because when they're busy, we're um, balancing our, our busy lives. A lot of us have children and family to take care of as well. So the shorter it is, the more succinct it is, the better it can be. Um, but the writing standard has to be up. It's a lot harder to write something shorter and succinct than it is to just go on and on and on. So it's, it's different. I think women don't look to, for, for the information quickly. They want a little bit of emotional content in that. Whereas men want to, to get the bigger blogs. That's what we found and that seems to be you know, the difference. But I think it's important for the, for the mainstream media to keep a space for long form stuff. Like There's been like a lot of great stuff. Like the one on Rob Ford in Toronto Life and that profile of Kristen Montana. Was that also yeah. Toronto Life? Yeah. 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 Surprises. No offense. Yes. 
quick point too, I think maybe it's some reason people don't blog, probably me especially, is if, if when you tweet, you have the option just to immediately react to something. You're just sending out 140 characters, that's all you got, you just send it out there and whatever happens, happens. Where if I just sit down and write a blog post, I'd probably stew over it for like a day or two, thinking, is this right? Are people going to judge me? What are the comments going to be like? Whereas the tweet, I don't really, it might be a bad thing, but I really don't think about it. It just goes out, and whatever happens, happens. <laughs> And then I'm going to come over to you guys, but um, is Citizen Akazagalia, to say that wrong? Akazalia, I'm sorry. I'm going to pick on you for a second, but you've been saying that the, this is, a lot of people have been saying this, and I don't know if I buy this, um, that it's such a niche uh, saturation uh, for the, in the Teal Poly community that there's no room. So I think, I, you know, I might regret this, but I'd like to open this up to the floor. For blogs, basically. For blogs. For also, like, you said, the Toronto and whatever. It just seems like there's already kind of, like, everyone's got their corner. You know the names. You know exactly who's going to be writing about what. So where do you get your in? Especially if most of those names are the guys. So it's a, it's a saturated market. So, I don't know. Does anyone want to... You already got a chance to talk, Neville. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone out in the crowd have a... I, I don't believe that. I think you got to... You have, you want to be unique? Get on out there. So, uh, I, I, I know, I good. You got. Yeah, you do. I saw. Okay. So, uh, this is what I was going to say. Um, yes, to, uh, and for, to what Sarah was saying, uh, we all of us here. That's great, and that's awesome, and that's amazing. And a lot of us talk to each other online as well. But in terms of getting the issues out there and discussing and and, 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 and talking about what's going to you know win over hearts and minds. Towards you know whatever our whatever some people's political endgame may be, that conversation has to happen at doors, right? Like that that is the, and that that's the thing that I hope some people will 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 talk continue this conversation online because we need to be out there in Scarborough. We need to be out there in Rexdale. Put down our phone. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
So if you do have a niche and that's, you know, there's one thing that you can't let go of, then go for it. It's totally fine. Fuck it, come with me. Met her someone on Twitter. I, would I get an intern who could just hang out at my apartment? <laughs> 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 and I teach them how to tweet. <laughs> um, which I, I, that's an open invitation if anybody wants to be my intern. That's fine. <laughs> so yeah, mentoring. I don't know. I think the closest thing that I've done to it is I try and encourage people to come out to council. Like I got my friend to come out during. I think it was the second LRT to the Shepherd Sun, the Shepherd Line. You know, just. See what goes on down there. See, it's not scary. It's quite interesting sometimes, and that you should be involved. And you should be there to support your counselor, whatever position you have, and talk to them afterwards and say thanks. You know, you did a good job, or you really sucked. But I think that's probably the first step. So. Yeah, and actually, just to add to that, I think probably the best way is just getting involved in politics in general. Is is volunteering for campaigns and coming to these events and that regardless of actually being mentored, I think just getting involved, jumping in head first. Um, I, I've had some discussions with my sister who's, who's not involved in this at all about, about what would she need to get involved and she says a, a big barrier is, I may have mentioned this before, but people not explaining the basics. And so it's, it's going to take some work before people can can get into politics and like add to our numbers. She suggested like like puppet reenactments of council scenes. Anyone else think that's a good idea? I can. That's a blog. Someone do that. Get the little puppets. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I sort of have an unfair advantage because the women's post we have. Um, a lot of women that volunteer and work with us, and we do have one woman that um, I've kind of taken under my, my, my wing, and, and all the women that I work with have, and she didn't even know how to use a computer. And to this day, now she's on, she's using a computer. Our next step is to get her on Facebook and Twitter. But that, that's the sort of thing you need to do is help the colleagues out that, are, that you work with. It's not just about being on Twitter. It's, he's right when he's, he mentioned, I'm sorry, I didn't know get his name, but he mentioned that it's about what you do at the doors. It's about what you do at, the, at work. It's about um, the conversations you have around you know, the, the, the cafeteria. Those, those things can really, really help um, women get more involved. As well as, I think, online, I guess the only thing I can think of is um, friending and following uh, women that are tweeting and just allowing them access to your group. I think that's the, the probably the top thing. Women mentor other women. Do you guys know about that? Can you tell us about that? Yes, there is. It was mentioned David Hicks' blog post, and I believe there's several oh, people who know that. In this per we're in this conference here today, <laughs> if anyone want to talk about it. Oh, oh okay. Um, wait. Uh, the Toronto Regional Champion Campaign is here tonight. Um, they have a booth. It is at the back of the room with all the other booths. So I would encourage you to check them out. But basically, uh, each female counselor has taken City on... City politics, journalism, when it's so saturated by men. So, I think we kind of touched on that, but I am... Um, oh, but, but Alicia had something to say, so... <laughs> That's a big problem, and nobody was is going to like the solution. Um, in my opinion, it is super saturated. Like, it means like some people die off or something. Or <laughs> 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 I'm not naming anybody. It just it would be really convenient if there were like a zombie invasion. Um, <laughs> oh, there was one. Um, the thing is. People mad, but please make people mad. Just men please. are going to have to take a step back and let someone else have an opportunity. And no, that diminishes all of us. No, I disagree. no. I disagree they, uh, they, this is how you get more diversity. Men need to take a step back, and it, unfortunately, the case of journalism means they will be getting less money, getting less precious attention, getting less bylines. But the the end goal will be a media scene that is diverse and reflective of a lot, of a lot more voices. And 
And not only that, will they have to take a step back, they're going to have to do their part to nurture new voices. So, balls in your report, guys. Okay, I'm a girl voice. No, it's because the people on the live stream are complaining that they can't hear. Oh, I'm sorry, live stream. Hi, everyone. I'm Phil Tom, the editor of Toronto West. And I want to say two things about that, and sorry, Alicia, I'm going to have to read you a little bit too. Um, the first thing is a word of encouragement. I have had several opportunities presented to me, some of them I've taken, some of them I've had, I haven't, but they've been presented to me in part because people like my work, and in part because I've had several men, editors, producers, people who have been doing this for a while saying, thank God there is a woman who is commenting on this stuff, because there are not enough women commenting on this stuff. There is a dearth of candidates. If you look at a thousand people who want to comment on X, one of them is going to make it one level up. There are not enough people at the levels lower down who are women who are actively writing about these things, commenting on these things often. And the second part of that that I see is that of the people who apply to write for Torontoist, who want to do political commentary, the vast majority have never met. The vast women who want to write about City Hall, and 80 to 90 percent of the people who want to write about City Hall are Torontoist are men. Okay. So if you want to write about City Hall, send me your clips. Okay, actually, I'm going to give Lisa a chance to explain because she's. Um, there was a piece on geek feminism at, um, the other day by Courtney Stanton, who's a game developer, and organized a conference where 50% of the speakers are women, which is very rare. Um, what, she, what she wrote was, when I talked to men about the conference and asked if they felt they had an idea for a talk, they'd always start brainstorming on the spot, and yet overwhelmingly, the women I talked to deferred with, I'm not an expert on anything, I wouldn't know what to submit, yes, but I'm not a lead, whatever, so you should ask my boss. I promise mentoring, practice sessions, one-on-one slide, slide deck reviews, encourage women in person, online, over coffee. I told them how much I respect their reputations, their ideas, and that I'd be thrilled if they had the time and interest in submitting a talk. So, it's, women are the ones who are socialized to take a step back, and if you want to solve that, you have to be a lot more proactive. Because there are a lot of women who are writing just as good stuff, you just have to encourage them to apply. That we really have not addressed. Um, people were not so thrilled that there was quite a lot of gender essentialism happening in the discussion. Um, there, you know, quite a lot of, well, women tend to be this way and men tend to be this way. I'm not saying I disagree with that personally, um, but I'm wondering if anyone in the audience, uh, you know, was feeling that and would like to maybe because the fact of the matter is there are fewer women that are part of this discussion and you know if like i'm not saying that gender essentialism is a thing but what would you trace it to uh if you don't think that women tend to be a certain way and men tend to be a certain way anyone you hand Hello? rise yell loudly as an intelligent young woman who has a lot of trouble being taken seriously, largely because I have um, tremendous breasts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> tremendous! <laughs> They're interesting. Um, I think a lot of people, <laughs> um, that women just flat out aren't taken seriously, especially young women, I think. Um, I mean, I am a member of the regional protege, seriously. And also, I don't think it's that women are necessarily nicer or better at negotiating or are better at sort of being the nice one, being the mediator. I think we're just taught to play that role from a time we're very, very young and are encouraged, um, sort of encouraged to take that back seat, to be the nice one. Um, and as a student of broadcasting, I know I'm going on here, but there have been actual studies done that show women do not read articles. A lot of women don't read articles about politics or watch news stories about politics because they literally feel that they are too stupid to understand them. And I think that that's a societal problem, and I think that it's a thing women have been conditioned to feel. So I don't believe that it's a, that you know men are like this and women are like this, and that's why women's voices are lacking. I think it's because women are actively told to stay out of the conversation. But you're still kind of saying along these lines that there is something... It's But is this, I, I, maybe, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but I think maybe the comments um, that I got from you is that, is this like an excuse that we're saying this is why there's a difference? No? Just to give some context to the comments, yeah. it seemed more a frustration with, um, because having it come back to, well,
That's why we weren't using this one live stream. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I think I think that it seemed to me like it was just a frustration that um, discussing how men are one way and women are another way is what these conversations seem to always reduce to. Um, and I guess maybe frustration that we weren't taking it beyond that. Um, I think it's an important thing to tackle if we do think that women and men tend to behave different ways. And I think that, uh, is it Emma? Yeah, I think you summed it up really well. It doesn't have to be something is born, it's something that perhaps is conditioned. Yeah. This goes back to the orgasm voice. We condition our voice to go higher. Yeah, uh, right there. I don't know. Let's try it. I think we have to grow into our own skin. And sometimes the younger women who are starting out their careers go in with the attitude, something's going to be, people are going to look at me differently. Once you get a little bit older, have a few kids, don't care about what you look like, you walk into an office, you expect to be respected. And if they don't respect you, you just give them that look. Every mom knows that look. It's currently at, at eight. One of those points I'm afraid is mine. <laughs> like, it's not about anything inherent in men and women because there's very little inherent in being a man or being a woman. It's not about your fucking chromosomes. It's, it's not about your body parts. It's, a, a, it's not about how you dress. It's about the role that you're expected to play. I remember when I was young and, start, and starting to look for jobs, my mother teaching me how to get a strong handshake. And to this day, people remark on it because like, it's very hard to actively, to actively like, change the way you're taught and to step outside those bounds. But, yeah, like, it just, it, we need to acknowledge that. And acknowledging that isn't saying men are this way, women are this way, and giving up. Um, it sort of puts us into these little boxes, and it's kind of hard for you to break out of your box. And I think that's the point we're trying to make. We're not just saying, no matter like this, no matter like this, um, let's just deal with it. We're saying, you know, we need to change that. And maybe we'll have to go, it's hard to change if you're an adult. Like, change is always hard. So maybe it's something that, we as a group of people need to start going to schools and say, and you know, high schools and things like that, and trying to say, you know, you don't have to fall into the spot, you don't have to be like that, you know, just because society thinks this, it doesn't ex exactly make it right. And I think that's it's a lot about, I guess, again, going back to mentoring and teaching people that you know, you you do you do not have to play this role. We need to make a concerted effort to support each other and support those who um, who really fall beneath the margins such as queer uh, and trans people, so. Who did it? <laughs> you cooked for us, so I'm gonna let you keep talking. <laughs> But 
if I don't have that kind of friendship, friends, how an immigrant from lives in Scarborough, his homemaker, uh, can to know more about without read every day the Toronto Sun or Metro. <laughs> so how approach <laughs> that communities and women they don't have or they don't they can't to use Twitter or Facebook because when I said many people it's not it's important because many things are changing around the world. So you need to be involved and take care even if it's not your city because it affects you in the first time when you put your first feet in Canadian customs. That it's like what I think and I want to know what I need to do more for being more involved in this new community when I'm integrated. Fear is a big issue. <laughs> um, but I think like from discussions that I've had with my own personal friends, every woman or every person um, has an opinion. And if you ask specifically, would you like to see more of this happen or less of this happen? They'd be like, yes, no, reasons why. But when you have to actually get out there and say it, and you're in a discussion, and she made me really think of it, um, vocabulary, language, how you are presenting issues and maybe not feeling like you know how to say it right or what's going to make a difference. And especially as a woman, I feel that the comments you make, maybe you feel more pressure um, for them to be really relevant and really on point. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, like, I was really disappointed because this was an opportunity for a, for men in journalism to talk about these ideas of masculinity and like it's not enough to be smart. You also have to conform to this stereotype of manliness where you could totally get in a fight, even though that's not that's not a journalist's job. Um, uh, we we have these ideas of what you need to succeed in politics, and that is a masculine ideal, and we enforce masculinity very violently. It's a it, it's bad to be effeminate. It's wrong, and it's and we need to step back from that if we want to start valuing anyone who's like anything else. But I'll tell you why. Oh, sorry. Well, I'm trying not to come up there because I'm going to be in your next panel, so I don't really have a right to be here today uh, in the in the front. But but it, it goes all the way back. Where's Lucas? It goes back to Lucas's comment, and, and it's a hard reality if what you're looking for is a perfect world, Toronto. Uh, if you're looking for that perfect progressive world, um, unfortunately, <laughs> I like her suits better than Hillary Clinton's. Hillary's the one starting to wear on me. Angela's not so stale. But at the end of the day, our constituency is not just you. It extends all the way up to the 85-year-old who's a uh, 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 front uh, drive I was on this morning at 9 o'clock in the morning because parks and transportation in their traffic calming project might cut down three catalpas on the boulevard, Mark. That getting the exchange of ideas there because so that people know sort of what's going on, especially since um, there are people out there that are on Twitter that might not read all the newspapers and all the blogs and open file, etc. You just need to sort of educate them. Right. And, uh, and I think that's so important to break these barriers and break these stereotypes and then to, it sounds cliche, but to actually be who you are. Don't be afraid that if being assertive and being a bitch um, would have been like... Everyone else who doesn't feel like being told to conform, come sit by me. 